right, uh, so let us start with prayer. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come to you, Lord God, in prayer and in um, seeking to understand your word, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that you continue to be with us in this time and in this moment. We pray, Father God, that as we um, hear your word today, Father God, let it penetrate all of our hearts, Lord God, and we and change us for the greater. We say thank you and we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus, your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So um, tonight's topic is going to be about grace. Um, as I said earlier, we're coming out of John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Uh, that's John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. And <clears throat> just to, to start, um, I believe I shared with everyone last week in our, um, you know, after the devotional, the time when we were um, contributing as a group. Um, but I shared with everyone that the Lord has been dealing with me regarding grace and giving grace. Um, I've accepted that although I might think, I might like to think of myself as being open-minded um, and, and, um, and caring about people, I am equally as judgmental. Um, what does that mean? Um, so I was actually having a conversation with my wife about this revelation. And in our conversation, I, re I said, man, I, I realize that I can be so hard on people at times and I don't want to be that way. I want people to feel loved and feel like our relationship is a safe space. Um, I know that I can have preconceived notions and preconceived judgments in, in talking to people before I talk to people and, and hearing different stories. And that causes me to pass judgment on people, which isn't right. Uh, I have to be open to listen. And then after explaining this to my wife, she turned to me and said, well, that's hard for you. <laughs> and um, but I'm, I'm glad and I'm, 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 I'm grateful to have a wife that's so honest. And um, I believe I'm easygoing. But like many people, I make the terrible mistake of measuring people according to their decisions without fully understanding who they are and what they have experienced. Uh, whether we realize this or not, our lives and decisions are often the product of our circumstances and experiences. Be it good or bad, our decisions have a base in some type of life event or mode of thinking. Therefore, grace is important. When ministering to or conversing with someone, we must do so with grace so that the preconceived notions and judgments that we hold that we hold do not prevent us from connecting with the individual and possibly impacting their life negatively. We must be willing to see things from each other's point of view so that we can love each other properly. This is grace. Seeing the person, understanding the circumstances, speaking the truth, and loving in spite of. So I just want to read uh, the 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 reference uh, coming out of John chapter four, verses one through six. Uh, now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. <clears throat> Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right. 
when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father near, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. So point number one, seeing the person and understanding the circumstances. There are a lot of different elements to unpack in this discourse between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, but I'm just going to deal with the grace aspect and seeing the person and understanding the circumstances. The Samaritan woman understood the social climate as she said, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Because of this, her response to Jesus was an effort to let him know that he was possibly making a mistake and that she understood what it was. Um, Jesus's response, however, of if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In this, Jesus, Jesus was giving a was was countering the social issue to ensure her that he was not mistaken, but to also <clears throat> introduce the more pressing issue of salvation through him. Her preconceived notions and understanding of the social climate could have alienated her from connecting with Christ. And if Christ had the same judgments, then there would be no exchange. Christ sees us and he understands the circumstances surrounding us, but he is unmoved by these things because he is Lord of all. Point two, speaking the truth. No one's perfect and we all do and have done things that may have that we may not may, that we may have not been proud of. Verses uh, 15 through 18 read, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have, what you have just said is quite, quite true. While truths like this hurt and being exposed may hurt even more, Addressing the truth sometimes helps us to come to grips with our situation. It also serves as a reminder that God sees all that we do. In addition to these, they let us know that while what we do is seen by God, he still loves us. Um, prior to even mentioning her having five husbands, Christ is engaging with the Samaritan woman. Some of us will not even talk to some people because we're toned off by some of the choices they have made in life. But speaking the truth requires that we not only engage in, in encouraging each other in the Lord, but also encouraging each other by correcting one another. This requires an element of grace on both sides. Um, and then the last point, love in spite, in spite of. At no point in this discourse do we see Christ casting the Samaritan woman out of his presence. Regardless of social issues or lifestyle choices, Christ continues to engage in conversation. We see later in the chapter that this woman's testimony turns out to be the catalyst for many other Samaritans to come to Christ. We know that God hates divorce and that he does not approve of adultery along with the many other things that he detests. But here is a question. If Christ held her past and present against her, would he have been able to reach her as well as the other Samaritans? The answer is no. Grace can be very complicated. It's not very often that you can empathize with the person and in the same conversation make mention of a potential misstep while expressing love. It's very difficult to embody all of these elements of grace in a single conversation. And though God does this for us daily, 
um, and he is great at it, it doesn't mean that we do it well. So here are a few pointers. Uh, be patient with others. Give people room. The same way God gives us room and, and, and he's seen our mistakes and loved us and, and dealt with us in spite of, we have to give the same room and even more to others. Um, it, 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 we are not God. We are not gods. We serve the one and only true and living God. So as he still gives grace and mercy, we have to give the same and we do not have the right to pass judgment. Second point, listen closely. Closely. People reveal a lot of, about themselves in what they say. People reveal a lot about themselves in the words that they use. Uh, you can Some people use big words and, and use very large phrases to try to prove uh, that they're intel or to, to prove their, their level of intelligence. And sometimes when they use those words and phrases, it exposes either that they have a high level of intelligence or it exposes that they're trying to be viewed as an intelligent person. Um, it, that, that can happen in, in multiple different ways, but uh, listening closely helps us understand who we are dealing with. Sometimes in our conversations and in, in general, we can hear a person's heart and hear the insecurities in their heart just by sometimes, you know, we're talking about listening, but even looking intently, looking in their eyes, looking at their mannerisms in there and their gestures. It can reveal a lot about what a person feels, how they feel, and also what they think. The third point, be open. Don't be afraid to share your story. Now, pick your spot. Sometimes uh, we can be very hasty in wanting to identify with what a person is going through that we um, hinder their ability to share. If there is room for us to share, then we should share, but we shouldn't be so so quick to just jump in and give our two cents and share our experiences. Sometimes some people just want to be heard. And again, there, there's a balance here. This is all wrapped up in grace, but we can't be afraid to share our story. And then the, the last part, love intentionally. Make sure that the love of God is something that you actively know and feel so that it comes across in our interactions. Um, there are some people that say that they know the Lord, but there is no evidence of love in them or in their actions. Love is intentional and it is always at work. It is placed in our inside our hearts by God so that we can give it to the world. Um, it's, I think it's, it's 1 Corinthians 13 and, and, and it talks about um, it talks about love being patient, love being kind. Prior to that, um, in Paul's letter, he is referencing all of the different gifts that the church in Corinth had at the time. But he started to also he 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 began to reference how how they're operating so well in these gifts, but they lack love. And in all of this, when we talk about grace, love is probably the 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 major aspect, especially the loving in spite of, because we can have all of the gifts and the talents in the world, but if we lack the love of God, if we if we lack the activity of love of God in our minds and in our hearts, we cannot give grace to others because we do not know what grace feels like ourselves. When we encounter the love of God, we are forced to sit back and not only look at ourselves, but look at the rest of the world through the eyes of God. So love is important. Loving intentionally is important. Here's a question. Where would we be without God's grace? <laughs> I can only imagine what that question means for me. So with that, I want to work on giving more and more and more and more and more grace to everyone else. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We ask, Father God, that it lay keenly on our hearts, Father God, and that you transform us from the inside. So Lord God, as we experience more of your love, we experience more of your grace, we're able to uh, give that to the world and everyone else around us on the outside. We say thank you and we give you glory, honor, and the praise in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.